Assalamu alaikum, everyone. <clears throat> Hope everyone's doing well. <clears throat> and uh, I'd like to thank <clears throat> the, uh, the department for organizing this camp and giving us all an opportunity to discuss uh, our course. So I teach a class in Islamic philosophical and theological ethics. And, um, and part of that course, I've, I've included a section on Sufism. So what this mini section that we're going to have today is um, a snapshot of the entire course. And I will, since we have two sessions, so the first session we will discuss some more of the philosophical aspect of the course. And the second session, we'll focus on the Sufism aspect. But essentially, they're, they're going to be intertwined throughout the whole two, both of the sessions. <clears throat> So let me, let me discuss sort of the, <clears throat> the, the philosophy behind this course. And that is that um, ethics is fundamentally a philosophical discipline. And we have you know, three essential aspects of ethics. We have meta-ethics, we have virtue ethics, and we have applied ethics. And there might be other aspects, sub, sub, uh, subdivisions of this. But these are the three major categories. So what I'm looking at here is, in this course, we're looking at epistemology, epistemological methods, looking at how one knows not just uh, how do we define what is good, what is virtue. Is there such a thing as virtue? And how do we come to recognize it and know this? So there, we must employ various methodologies and look into um, you know, dig deeper philosophically. So this is why I've included a section, a large section on, on mysticism, because this is one of the tried and true approaches in Islamic thinking, Islamic thought. It, it, has, it has always been, since the earliest days, a, a mainstay of Islamic thought and practice. Now, whether it was called Sufism or not, this is another issue. And this is why I, I tend to shy away from using this term Sufi and Sufism because it has its own connotations and it carries, it carries a certain baggage. So we look at, maybe we can call it mystical thought or Islamic spirituality or, um, you know, in Arabic, Arfan, uh, as, as one of the terms that we use to describe this discipline. So let's briefly look into the syllabus which will kind of help you to understand the the thinking behind the course and how it weaves its way into the different topics the first thing we do in the course is we define ethics and we define the nature of goodness and ethical paradigms what is the nature of goodness then we get into the classification of sciences now why is this important why do we need to classify the sciences or the disciplines, classify knowledge? Well, as we know, many Islamic scholars, this has been a huge part of the Islamic tradition, which was to classify knowledge. In order to understand the limits and scopes of knowledge, what is the field of ethics or, or philosophy or jurisprudence, we have to classify it. Is it a theoretical discipline or is it a practical discipline or both? And so we get into the classification of sciences, we look at some of the oldest uh, descriptions of these classifications. Um, even Aristotle had a very uh, extensive classification dividing theoretical knowledge and practical knowledge. Metaphysics and you know, metaphysics, mathematics, po politics, all those different classifications. And we find that he places ethics in practical knowledge. And we will get into this a little bit later. <clears throat> Then, in the course, I've included a section after discussing the, the nature of or the classification of ethics, we look at the soul and its faculties. Then we get into why do we discuss the soul and its faculties? Because when we look at the definition of ethics, it comes from akhlaq or khuluq, which is disposition. But it actually comes from the Arabic word from khalaqa. Right? This is to create, to, to make something. So it is as if ethics is, is indicating that it is 
these are not only uh, predisposed predispositions or God-given dispositions, but these are dispositions that one creates in oneself. And, we, and there's a difference between those inherited qualities that we receive from our parents, from our, 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 our environment, our upbringing, and those things we perform through habit and actualization of different aspects of the self. So ethics is primarily concerned with the latter, with those qualities that a person instills through practice, through habit, through contemplation, through working towards achieving and acquiring. So this is, you are creating these khuluq. You are creating these, these qualities in the self. And there's a lot to be said about this. So this is just some preliminary remarks. Now, there was an interesting section in the course which I included, and it's on the concept of wisdom. There was sort of two class sessions that we devoted to wisdom. Now, we know from the, the, from the earliest times and the earliest writer that wisdom was the highest ethical virtue. Wisdom is as if, uh, not just in the peripatetic or Aristotelian tradition, a very, the, the most important virtue, but even in the Islamic tradition, wisdom is considered to be one of the great principles of Islamic knowledge. Hikmah. So there's a whole tradition of hikmah in Islam. It goes back to the divine name Al-Hakim. God is the knowledgeable and the wise. And wisdom is not just an ethical virtue, but a, a way of knowing things. It's an epistemological method. And we get into this a little bit in this course. We, we look at how a person can adopt uh, a, a culture of wisdom or, or seek aphorisms and be acquainted with uh, uh, the wisdom tradition, not just in Islam, but in all, all different traditions. <clears throat> then we go back into understanding the soul, the knowledge of the soul, degrees of the human soul. And we said that the khuluq refers to dispositions of the soul. So really, the soul is the foundation of this of this course and this way of understanding ethics. <coughs> Philosophical ethics, at least in traditional Islamic thought, has always revolved around notions of the soul. What is the soul? What are its propensities, its inclinations, its development, so on and so forth. And this is exactly what the Sufis did, but from a different perspective. However, <clears throat> the soul as being the center point, we still discuss we move on and we look at the issues of good and evil, philosophically. Um, and the manifestation of the divine names. And these go into some of the kalami, some of the theological aspects of the course. Theology defines or describes what is the nature of good, what is the nature of evil, how does evil come to be? How can a good God create evil in the world if everything is from God? This is a, a critical philosophical question, relates to the nature of good, and ultimately, ethics and human virtue. Now, after having discussed wisdom, we look at the divine nature of the intellect. What is the intellect? And what is the role of the intellect? We look at certain traditions and certain statements on the soldiers of the intellect and the soldiers of ignorance. The issues of justice. Now keep in mind, when we look at the intellect, we look at wisdom, we look at justice. These are all, in the human kingdom, the four cardinal virtues, at least according to the Aristotelians. What are they? Temperance, courage, uh, wisdom, and justice, the four cardinal virtues. So we look at justice from the perspective, the ethical, personal perspective, as human being as the center, or we look at it as a as an abstract concept. What is the nature of justice? What is divine justice? How can a just God create injustice in the world? Where does injustice originate from? It's the same concept of evil we looked at, and how, how, does, how do these things play out? What is the justice of eternal hellfire? If a person commits certain evil acts in this life, for a limited amount of time, 
then how is it just that they would be punished eternally in hellfire? How can we make that justification? What is the philosophical arguments? So this is going into philosophy and theology. And remember, these disciplines, when we call them philosophy or theology or mysticism, they're not discrete elements. They are all intertwined. They're all interwoven. We looked at in the previous lecture of scriptural ethics. Most of this information, most of the, the sources of knowledge is coming from Quran and Sunnah for the Islamic philosophers. Even if philosophy is fundamentally a, a, a discipline which exercises the intellect um, and, and the rational mind without the assistance of theology. It doesn't base, it, base its principles on theological principles or premises. It comes to the nature of a thing in and of itself through reason. But anyway, uh, the thinkers, the Muslim philosophers were influenced and they were themselves theologians. The philosophers were theologians, they were commentators on the Quran, they were uh, transmitters of hadith. So they were not, a, there was, it was not a thing like this one's a philosopher and another one is a, is a theologian. Many of them were multidisciplinary and this was our tradition and is. As far as contemplative ethics, this is delving now into mysticism and spiritual wayfaring. These are important elements of our inquiry into how to become an ethical person. What does it mean to, um, to, be, to reach perfection or reach good or virtue? How does this happen? Is it through contemplation? Is it through Sim, uh, rational thought, or simply practice of the Sharia. The outward form will ensure the inward form. Is that the case or not? This is an important question to ask. Then towards the end of the course, we look at certain thinkers, look at how they argued, what was their standpoint, and so on. Now, let me go into the basic division between philosophy and Sufism. Because these are the two major center points of the course. Philosophical ethics and mystical ethics. What is the difference? What is the difference between philosophy and Sufism? Is Sufism a type of philosophy? It is, a, is it a philosophical system or not? Or is it simply a spiritual way, a set of practices? <clears throat> the basic, <clears throat> there are certain key differences between the two. And I'd like to highlight them here. The first thing is that philosophy and Sufism have many shared attributes. But as far as their epistemology goes, they are very different. Why? Because philosophy focuses on reasoning and the rational mind. The philosopher uses the mind to reach truth. And it believes, and he believes, that the intellect is the highest principle through which mankind can reach the truth. As opposed to this, the mystic is not necessarily opposed to the intellect, but, is, but it does not see the intellect as being sufficient to reaching the truth. The mystics uses other means, such as the heart, the qalb, and there are different terms of the inward constitution that we find even in the Quran. We see we have lub, we have qalb, we have aql, we have nafs, we have ruh, we have sir, we have akhfa. So there's maybe seven or eight different terms that the Quran uses to describe the center or the, <coughs> the intelligence or the inward doma domain of the human being. 
But to simplify matters, let's say that the philosopher uses the rational mind to arrive at truth, and the mystic uses the spiritual mind, which is the qalb. So the first one, the former, the philosopher, will use the rational proof, logic, dialectic, argumentation, premises and conclusions to arrive at truth. And the mystic will rely on visionary knowledge. Visionary knowledge. Now, is there such a thing? Is there such a thing as visionary knowledge? We have hadith, we have verses of the Quran speaking about al-ilmunurun, that knowledge is light. And the whole concept of illumination of the heart, and so on and so forth, this is a, a huge chapter in our <clears throat> understanding. So visionary knowledge is a thing. And the mystic uses visionary knowledge primarily as the fundamental means of arriving at truth. And secondarily, rational knowledge. Some of them don't even use rational knowledge. They think they, think, they believe that rational knowledge is a hindrance, is a veil. It's an illusion. So there are different schools amongst the mystics who arrive, um, and we won't discuss those differences here. The other difference between the two is the philosopher is, bases the acquisition of truth on personal effort, for the most part, up until he reaches ittasal or the the unification or union between the personal intellect with the divine intellect. But that, that is at the highest level. Whereas the mystic uses divine reception. So this vision, this visionary knowledge, is one which he receives from God. He sees, and after purification and unveiling, he reaches the realities or spiritual realities. The philosopher, furthermore, delves into the branches of learning and knowledge, whereas the mystic delves into states and stations, ahwal and maqamat. So you see, there are very different approaches in finding a truth. So in short, Sufism can be described as the pursuit of inward knowledge, the mysteries of existence, and certain divine secrets. Whereas in philosophy, if we look at, if we take ethics as our, as our subject matter in philosophy, it deals with ethics, uh, I'm sorry, virtues, and the ac acquisition of virtues. Whereas the mystic or mysticism deals with makaram al-akhlaq. So we have akhlaq on one hand, the acquisition of virtues through hab habituation, performance of good deeds, and the other is the makaram al-akhlaq. Now I'll explain what this term means. The makaram are the, the highest virtues, the most noble virtues. And these are essentially the divine names which appear in the character of the human being. So if the person is just, acts justly, there is a certain level where the human being can be just. <laughs> this is a human acquisition. But after a person acquires justice to the full measure of his or her capacity, then that person becomes receptive of divine justice, the quality of divine justice. So in a sense, there is a meeting between man and God. And this meeting point is what is known as the makaram, the embodiment of the divine qualities, the divine character traits. 
as the hadith says, تَخَلَّقُوا بِأَخْلَاقِ الله. So adorn yourself, embody the divine character traits, which are the, the 99 beautiful names. The wise, the clement, the merciful, and so on. The knowledgeable. These are all qualities that the human being can possess and can acquire. But not without precedent, not without effort. So there's, a, there's human effort and there's divine um, bestowal. Both of these are at work. Questions at this point? Dr. Ali. Yes. Hi. Yes. Um, you mentioned about philosophers and mystic mm, individuality. Can mm. you please explain the difference again between philosophers and a mystic person? So the most the, the basic difference has to do with their epistemology. It has to do with how they understand they come to understand the truth. The philosopher uses the mind, the rational mind. And the mystic uses the, the heart, or certain practices. There are more differences, but the basic difference is this. And the um, practice of spirituality, Yes. is it on the same level, or they both practice in different way? So now, the, the mystic, the Islamic mystic, I'm speaking about the, the, the Islamic mystic, not in other traditions. The Islamic mystic adheres to the Sharia. For the mystic, it is, it is essential to, to follow the commandments of God through which a person becomes capable or um, becomes uh, qualified to receive spiritual and inward knowledge. Without adherence to the outer law, one cannot begin to train the inward self. So this is, this is the, 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 the main, uh, one of the tenets of mysticism. Whereas in philosophy, that's not necessarily the case. In philosophy, it's not necessary that a person adheres to the sharia, the outward law, because it's really, it's, it's a rational exercise. I'm sorry? In philosophy, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, that's not important because... Uh, I mean, in, in, in Sufism. Yes, yes, exactly. In, in Sufism, is, there is, the heart is, is a center, it's key. Yeah. Okay, we'll explain what the heart is. Yeah, but maybe it's just a question. Um, yeah. How can we understand it that uh, in, in Islamic theology, uh, the, the aql is placed in the heart? So, I mean... It, that's a good, that's a very good question. So or, how can we distinguish? Yes, so now remember, when we talk about the aql, we're not referring, to, we're not negating the aql in an absolute sense. We are saying that, the, according to the mystic, mm -hmm. the mystic is not critiquing the aql, but it is, it is critiquing the rationalistic approach to knowledge. The aql is, is a spiritual thing. The aql, in, in Islamic, in Islamic thought, the aql is, is a divine gift. But the, the aql that the philosopher uses is not the, the real aql. Mm. It is a shadow of the aql. If you want to go into the aql, then there's statements from the Prophet and, and so on saying, awwalu ma khalaq Allahu al aql or a nur. So there's different versions. The first thing that God created was the intellect. The intellect is the pen. The intellect is the qalam al-a'la. The intellect is a nur. It is the supreme spirit, a ruh al-a'zam. The intellect is all of these things. You know, we say that uh, the, the Umm al-Kitab and all these different terms in the Quran, there's different explanations for these things. And one of them is that the intellect is the highest principle. So it is not a criticism of the intellect 
in and of itself, or the highest intellect. But it is, the, it is rationalism, discursive reasoning, logic, without resorting to spiritual principles. So there is a higher intellect. And so it's an excellent point you raise. Because we have not just the qalb, which is the heart, but, and we have the aql, but we have the aql al-qalb and the qalb al-aql. Qalb just means the inner aspect of something. The inner aspect of the intellect is the qalb. It's not, not two separate things. The aql is the qalb. The inward aspect, when you go deeper into the mind, into the heart, I'm sorry, the aql, it becomes the qalb. <coughs> On the surface is the aql. But as you go deeper, inwardly, spiritually, through meditation, contemplation, and so on and so forth, then you reach the core, aql. So on the surface, it's Islam, and on the core, it's Iman. <coughs> it's one reality. Islam and Iman are one reality. But on the surface, they call it Islam, because Islam governs the outward. Iman governs the inward. Similarly, the aql is the outward, and the qalb is the inward. This is why... The mystics, they only oppose the philosophers if the philosopher refuses to assent to the qalb and relies only on surface knowledge, only on rational knowledge. That's the first thing. And the second thing is this. This is very important. This is, this is the key point right here. It is that the mystic, when he or she engages in the heart, one of the qualities of the heart is to receive. The heart is like a vessel. It receives. The aql is active. It moves. But the heart is, rece is, is receptive. So what does it receive? It receives knowledge of the aql, and it receives inspiration from God. And so this second dimension is the heart of spirituality, is to be able to sense and receive from God are, the, are only the prophets capable of this? No. They receive the highest level, wahi, that's what it's called. They received at the most comprehensive level, but everything, even the small creatures, even the inanimate objects, they receive from the Lord. So the heart of every human being is receiving, whether it's knowledge or arzak, certain different kinds of sustenance, everything and everyone is receiving from its Lord. So to make the heart a receptacle of divine reception, this requires training, this requires certain exercise, this, this requires purification, it requires a lot of things. So the, the main argument against the philosopher is that how can you rely solely on philosophical knowledge, on rational knowledge, when the greater share of the human being resides in the heart? Now, <clears throat> there were some mystics who, who actualized both heart and intellect. They saw visions, they received, and they tried to express that in language. Some wrote poetry, some wrote treatises, philosophical treatises, some wrote stories, <coughs> allegories, describing their visions and what they saw, or truths. A vision must have a truth. It must accompany a truth to be knowledge. You can have a vision, but you don't know what it means. 
The meaning is what you're looking at. You're, you're looking. A lot of people can have visions. So now, the, these methodologies, whether it's philosophy or it's mysticism, these are not separate by any stretch of the imagination from other disciplines in Islam, such as jurisprudence or Quranic exegesis or hadith, hadith studies. There's just, there, there are just different emphases to emphasize a certain aspect. <clears throat> Because the laws of Islam, it defines the lawful and the prohibited, which is itself a moral code. Jurisprudence and Islamic law is itself a moral code. One who applies the Islamic laws in its totality can live a moral life. However, is, but morality is not limited to the outward performance of actions. And this is the, the major thesis of, of what we are saying of the Course, is that at the end of the day, <clears throat> morality is <clears throat> a disposition of the soul. It is a quality of the soul. It has to do with the inward intention of the human being. A person might pray outwardly, but inwardly may not be sincere or be hypocritical and so on. Or they may give charity outwardly, but they do not possess karam. Karam is a quality of the soul. The giving, the outward giving, it looks like karam, but it could be riyah, it could be ostentation. So, as the statement goes, <clears throat> God does not look at your forms and faces, but he looks at your hearts and actions. So heart and action. The heart is the place of intention. And the action is its outward manifestation. But if there is a disconnect between the action and, and the heart, it's nothing really. Right? Maybe the, the reward is simply on the outward. But as we see, God does not look at your outward forms. He looks at, at your hearts and your actions, the, com the both of them, the combination. It may be the person is generous, but has nothing to give. So does that mean the person who ha does not have the ability to give is not generous? They could be generous. They could be great generosity stored within this person. The perfection of generosity. But they don't have a way to give. So people look at this person and say, oh, this person is not generous. <coughs> I've never seen this person give anything. But in fact, it's the inward quality of the soul that God is looking at. Okay, <clears throat> what are we looking at time-wise? Oh. Okay, two, all right. Right, now, <clears throat> there are a number of issues that come up in a course like this. We talked about, for example, divine justice, good and evil. Let's look at good and evil. This is a, a, an essential philosophical concept which relates to ethics the nature of good and evil. Um, and you know, Islamic, in Islamic thought, we have different schools, the Asharis, the Mu'tazali, right? Let me ask you this. <clears throat> Do you think that things, actions, have intrinsic goodness or not? Let's hear from you. Hmm? Do actions have intrinsic goodness or not? Or are they determined good because God approves of them? 
when you ask this question, I have to think about uh, the story of Musa and Khidr. Mm. Mm. So um, I think um, it's not so. Um, it, 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 it depends on the circumstances and the niya and um, the ability, as you have spoken before, what's when I'm generous, but I don't have anything to do. So now, how, how, how uh, should you uh, identify me or my character? So uh, I think uh, it's all about the circumstance, and that's what our religion uh, teaches us when in the Mala'amalu bin Niyat. So it's, it depends on, 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 on the niya and the circumstances. Okay, but what about intrinsic goodness in a thing? Can there be such a thing as intrinsic goodness? Is it all relative? Because if there was no, if we couldn't determine intrinsic goodness, then it would almost negate the role of the intellect. How can we know, especially within the Ashari and Mu'tazari debate, how can the intellect judge something? You say, well, it's all relative, only God knows. And only what God deems as good is good, even if, as Khidr did, it killed the boy. Right, we know later on there's, there's secrets in this story. Okay? But at face value, no, we, we, who are we talking about? It's not Khidr and the village grocer. It's Musa, alayhi salam. Kalimullah. One, he, the, the one who had a sharia. The, one of the five great prophets, he couldn't understand what's going on. Khidr kills this boy. He doesn't know. Outwardly, this is obviously this is reprehensible. There's, no one can justify this. No sharia, no law, no aql can justify this. And this is mentioned clear, crystal clear in the Quran. This is what Khidr did. So these kind of stories, these parables, make us question. It's just such, an, it's such a powerful story. It makes us question how we, do we approach ethics. Is it linear? Is it simply acquisition? Or is it just sharia, just follow sharia? Just sharia has, is all-encompassing? Or is it something else? Or is it ilm al ghayb Knowledge of the unseen. Well, Musa didn't have it at the time. He could not understand. Only Khidr had it. Anyway, there's so many questions this, thing, this, this, this story in the Quran raises. So the point of asking such a question is, <clears throat> is to start to investigate different methodologies. Think outside the box when you look at, when you, when you come across ethical questions. There's an issue of relativism, rel relativism or essential goodness, or it, it can be said that things have essential goodness. It can be said. We can, we can make this argument. But maybe not absolutely. Or you can look at life, <clears throat> the world in different tiers. So for example, there is a law of this world and then there's spiritual laws, or laws of the ghayb, the haqiqa, which Khidr was operating with. Because he was operating to a hukm, hukm Allah. It's a law. Ultimately, he was operating under some paradigm. But that paradigm <clears throat> conflicted with the paradigm of this world. So certain metaphysical realities are there. There are laws, there are ahkam of that world, which we may or may not know of. But it does not undermine the sharia of this world that God has placed for us. It cannot undermine and say, oh, those, those are laws. The sharia is not applicable to me because I'm now in communion with God. It's not the case. There are exceptions. This was an exception. But that exception tells us something. Uh, yes. Maybe you can back, uh, come back to your question. Mm. I think um, maybe we can say that um, our principles we have from the Quran, our maqasid, they are intrinsic good. Maybe that can be an answer to your question. 
perhaps, so the, perhaps the principles who are intrinsic good, and we have to to cover them and to save them. Yes, yes. <clears throat> So it wasn't such an easy debate between the Ashaira and the, and the Mu'tazila. It was, it, was, it was deep, it was complicated. They weren't simpletons. They were deep thinkers who couldn't wrap their head around this apparent paradox. Let's ask this question. <clears throat> what is the origin of evil? Anyone? <laughs> okay, Islamically speaking. Okay, um, who caused Satan to fall? Okay, anyone else? How did he become arrogant? It's a vice. Where did that come from? Where the origin of evil? He acted evil, but what is the origin of that evil? Mm -hmm. Anyone else? What do you guys think? Mm. He was the origin of, of that because um, once I read the tafsir of um, the story of Adam and his son, it was saying that um, uh, what led uh, Adam to eat from the forbidden tree was, in fact, uh, that the shaitan has to motivate him by saying he will uh, gain uh, infinity and like like be like an angel, and that was this was uh, his intrinsic motivation that. To the power and to earn something he has not infinity. So maybe this is okay. Well, yes. Come so question is beginning of evil, right? Yes. Uh, I, I know. I, like I think, for instance, uh, Ibn Arabi has a, has a very distinct answer, <laughs> but I won't go there. <laughs> but perhaps it's uh, at the beginning of creation, wherein uh, Iblis um, refused to accept Allah's judgment on the creation of man. Allah Allah. Okay, yes. Come back. Okay, after you. Yeah. Uh, is it about the wisdom, the knowledge? Because uh, tracking the creation story, when the Iblis was asked to saju, uh, I mean, to, uh, I mean, the sitting was there for where Adam was being uh, presented in front of um, angels, jinns, and all. And uh, the, there's a verses, there are verses in the Quran about Adam, his personality that I made him knowledgeable. So, is it the wisdom that created evil? I mean, the knowledge, and that is how uh, Iblis just. Uh, I mean, deviated from the path. Okay, I'm going to listen to everyone. Just yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Yeah. Can you speak up a little bit? Sorry. Yes. Uh, yeah, to um, complement what has already been said, I think um, 
from my perspective, uh, the ayah in Surah Al-Falaq, which says, from the evil, uh, I seek refuge from the min um, ma uh, khalaq, from the evil that you created. So um, I think there's that uh, reciprocity that Allah SWT, you seek refuge or, or you seek um, help through God from the evil that he's created. So it's like the, the, the evil is there, it's existing, but you're, you're seeking help from God in order to alleviate whichever evil exists, but it, it's coming from God. And I think uh, also uh, one of the names of Allah SWT is uh, the originator. So when, we, when we're talking about this, uh, about the idea of where does it originate from, um, wouldn't we say that in light of these um, injunctions that it's coming from God? Yes. I think actually it's about jealousy and love because he feels that the human is loved more by God than he is, so he gets jealous, so he tries to <laughs> make the human bad, so he gets back the love. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, uh, as per my uh, reading of the Quran and overall uh, being in touch with mysticism, I think Iblis is being very obedient to the thing he initiated. Um, by, um, I mean, creating that environment, I'll be the one who will be deviating the human race, and I'll see who will obey and who will disobey. This is how things are being, like, uh, how evil and good that are being, uh, I mean, they move on, on the same track. And uh, the Iblis, who, which we could consider as an evil, at times the evil one, but he is very obedient to the will of uh, whatever he said, and uh, with the, um, I mean, the idea of what he chose and what were the consequences that uh, not only him, but if, uh, all human, entire human race is also being affected by the same. But uh, there comes the akal uh, when we are being deviated or we, uh, the, let's say, insecurities are put in our mind and that is how humans behave in a pattern or in a situation to deal with good things and bad things as per the akal as well as uh, through the mystical, uh, let's say, through mystics and or whatever we feel from the heart. So. Good. Yes. <clears throat> uh, can we say that God is the creator of the evil? Because if I'm going to uh, do a follow up with the ayah, he said, Wami Shari Mahalak. And also in Surah Al Sad, he said, Lamla Anna Jahanna Minka, Wiman Tabak Minhum Ajmain, Illa Ibadaka Minhum Mokhlasin. So it means Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is the creator of the evil. Can we say that? I'm not going to say it. <laughs> <laughs> Because, yes. okay. because uh, for him, he knows that mm. uh, by all means, some of the uh, creation will be in the hellfire. So why he was just going to uh, punish uh, Satan? OK, couple things. Anyone else? I'm going to make comments. I'm not going to answer the question, because there isn't any crystal clear answer to this question. Does anyone else want to speak on this? A few things. OK. The, this question helps us to investigate the nature of existence. And in doing so, we must know that existence, there's a tartib, there's, a, there's a, a sequence of events. So when we ask the origin of evil, we're saying, what is in existence? When did it first occur? God was absolutely good. And then there are the divine names. At what point? did evil begin to arise in wujud? So we know it exists. So it must have been created by God. 
Okay? We know that. There's no denying this. That, there, that evil exists and all that exists has been created by God. So then it goes back to God. But it doesn't go back to God. Dhatan. So we have to distinguish between the essence, the names, and then creation. So look at the trajectory of existence, number one. The second thing we must inquire is the nature of the self. This is why the subject of akhlaq looks at ilm nafs without knowing the self, the soul. You cannot determine, or it is very difficult to determine what is good and evil. Because these are ultimately colorations of the self. Sometimes you can, if we look at the nature of actions, we look at applied ethics. We look at what is the nature of things externally without reference to the self. Is that a thing which is good or bad? But even still, it must come back to the self, the doer. So there's two things we must ask in this type of question, or we must investigate deeper. What is the nature of existence, and what is the nature of the self? OK, now, let's, look at the, let's try to answer this question now. OK, some scholars have said, said it like this, that in the beginning, Iblis was not evil. Okay? He was a beautiful creature of God. And he worshipped God for, for eons. And because of his worship and his service, God raised him. He was a jinn, but he raised him above the angels. So this is a shut-off. So he, he granted him a nobility, particular nobility. So he was, he's, he was out of his class. His class was the class of the jinn, but God pushed him out of that class, to a higher class. <coughs> However, there was a movement inside of Iblis, which in the beginning was not bad. It was just a movement. Okay? That movement, over a course of eons, started to crystallize. So in the beginning, the movement was not bad. There was no evil at all. But when it started to accumulate, that movement started to accumulate, it tilted the spectrum a little bit. There became an imbalance in his nature. And that imbalance then gave rise to a certain quality. The quality then gave rise to a certain action or attribute, and then ultimately a certain action. But in order for that quality to come to fruition, God produced a test. He wanted to show both Iblis himself and the others what was inside. And so, he manifested that through the test. So there, because of this imbalance, which you can call initial imbalance, which later became an evil, just like health. In the beginning, if you have an inclination towards sugar, you like sweets, nothing wrong with that. Children love sweets, their bodies can handle it. But as they grow up, their bodies change. Something changes. Metabolism changes. If they keep eating sweets as they did at, when they were children, it will, have, it will form a disease because the body will not be able to cope with the same type of movement. So things progress. The human being changes. He progresses. There's different ahwal, different states when you're, you, you, certain actions you do as a youth are measured differently than your adolescence, 
then your 20s and your 30s and your 40s and so on. You can do the same action, but they are counted differently. The measure is different, the criteria is different because the circumstances have now changed. So similarly, when, there are, when there's a certain imbalance in the soul, then if it accumulates, it can become a disease. That disease is what's called evil. <coughs> the spiritual disease is called an evil. If it comes out to the external, then all the more so. So this is one way of understanding the nature of good and evil. How things can remain good on the highest plane of existence. But when God created the world and there was different layers of creation, different marat of wujud, different strata of existence, each has a particular set of laws that govern it. So what might, might be appropriate for one world is not appropriate for another world. This is why it's necessary to know the nature of existence. But in, in our case, when we study ethics, it is essential to know the nature of the self, the soul. What is the soul? How does it operate? What are its proclivities? And so on. And this, inshallah, we'll tackle in the next session.